Good morning, everybody. We are continuing our series, Church and State. It's an election season, and we want to equip you every two years when we go to the polls to think about politics and your vote biblically. God's given you stewardship in America, if you're a citizen, as a voter. He's given you a piece of the rule of this country. That's a precious gift, and we want to use it well. So last week, we looked at the issues that we're facing coming this fall and what the Bible has to say about them. And we also looked at the fact that no matter what happens in an election, our God reigns. The Lord Jesus Christ is the ruler over all the kingdoms of men. And he raises up kings and he brings them down and he changes times and seasons. And it feels like America is going through a winter time right now. There is increased injustice and violations of our rights at the hands of our own government. And when we see corrupt men, or people that we would say are wicked and violating God's law, ruling, happy, and they don't seem to have any consequences for their choices, it can cause us to feel angry, envious, and despair. We have to be careful. We don't want to react. Because when you react, rather than respond carefully in faith, you don't protect the things you love, you end up destroying the things you love. This is how your enemy is able to trick you and cause you to make poor decisions that can lead to negative consequences in your life. Justice is a big topic in America today. There's a lot of strong emotions about them. And so we wanna make sure we're thinking about the topic of justice and how God rules injustice in this world and how we should respond and resist injustice against us as Christians if that time should come. So let's look at the topic of justice and let's look at what God has to say about it. The Bible is clear that God is just and that he rules this world with justice. In Deuteronomy, it says he is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are justice. Everything he does is just. And God, a God of truth, no lies, and without injustice. There's not a little thing, a little bit, just a little smidge of injustice. No, no, God is pure and perfect justice. Righteous and upright is he. Justice in the Bible means paying back what is owed. When you repay people what they're owed, that is justice, whether it's good or ill. And God, in the scriptures, shows us that he rewards those who, are, who do good and he punishes those who do evil in his time in ways that he thinks is good. You can count on it. But today, there are a lot of things that you could probably point out and say, that's not right, that's not just. What are you doing, God? Why aren't you stopping it? And it's okay to ask God this question. From the beginning of the Bible to the end, God's people have cried out, when are you going to execute your justice on those who are harming us and taking away our rights, on those who are taking away our liberty, our property, our lives? Why are you watching this? Why do you delay your justice? For, for example, in the Old Testament, the prophet Habakkuk said, God, you are of pure eyes than to see evil. You cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? I'm sure you could point to people in our society who seem to have a lot of power and a lot of success, who break the rules or openly flaunt and rebel against God's law, who promote wicked policies, whether it's in a local or state or national government. And yet the people who are trusting God and trying to walk in faith with God are having a harder and harder time. Why are you doing this? Why are you delaying? In the New Testament, <clears throat> the Christians who were martyred under the persecution of the Roman emperors, whose lives were taken because they refused to say Caesar is Lord, they cry out to the Lord under the altar and here's what they say. How long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? They're asking God to stop delaying his justice and to avenge them. You see, injustice makes us angry. It makes us despair and can even cause us to want to take vengeance and justice into our own hands. This is what explains the violent civil unrest that we see all across our country more and more today. And if we don't prepare our minds for action ahead of time, before the outcome of the election, if it doesn't go the way we want, if we think the bad guys won, we're very likely to react in some very foolish and sinful ways that will only destroy the good that God is giving us and not build it up. You see, the enemy knows that justice is a big issue for human beings, and he knows how to use it just right to undermine our faith and lead to our destruction. Satan points out the injustice in our society and says, maybe God doesn't rule the world in justice, or maybe God isn't just at all. And he tries to get you to doubt God. 
And then you start to think, well, if they're getting away with it, I'm gonna do it too. And you start compromising with evil. You start violating God's law. You start not walking in faith, but walking in the flesh and grabbing and taking and doing what's best for you, even though it's not right, it's not just. And of course, the, the end game for Satan is vengeance. He wants us to be so angry and so frustrated and so envious and so full of malice towards those that we see as unjust that we'll get vengeance on our own. We'll take matters into our own hands. And this is what we saw happen in the summer of love during the George Floyd riots when cities were being burned to the ground and even in the January 6 protests. In both cases, these people felt like the bad guys were winning, they were getting away with it, and they were gonna take matter into, matters into their own hands. And that played into their enemy's hands. We don't wanna be fooled, we don't wanna react. We wanna think about things biblically and respond well. Now I felt angry, I felt like the, the bad guys were getting away with it all through 2020, all through COVID and all the craziness of that year. I was very frustrated, very angry, and I felt vengeful. I knew it wasn't right, and thankfully, God's word gave me what I needed to correct my thinking and get back on track. I read the Psalms, I read 1 Peter, and it really helped me get my head right. One of the Psalms especially that helped me was Psalm 73 because this Psalm is written by a guy who was feeling just like I was feeling. Listen to some of the parts of this Psalm. He says, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, but as for me, my feet almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Here I see these people doing these evil things and they're getting away with it. And I felt envy. Envy means that I want to destroy or take or tear down what they have. It's not that I want it. It's not jealousy. It's envy. I don't want them to have it. I want them to get paid back. And this is what he said he felt. He says, therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. In the psalm, he says that even God's people began to be fooled by the wicked, by the unjust. They seem to be successful, so God's people began to follow after them. They listen to their podcasts, they watch their, their speeches, right? They read their books, they imitate their lifestyle, and they start to think about God in all sorts of ways that are true. They start to say things about God that are not true. And I was seeing that happening in 2020. I was seeing the church and Christians all over the place getting blown here and there by, by lies and manipulation, and it was very frustrating. And then he said, here's my experience. Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. Meaning, he's trying to walk in faith and obey the Lord, and his life is difficult. But these guys, they're healthy and they're wealthy and they're happy. It's not right. God, what are you doing? When are you going to stop this? But then he says that God straightened him out, just like God straightened me out. He went to church, to the sanctuary of God. He says, but when I thought of how to understand this, it seemed too wearisome to me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. When I got my head right was when I went to worship, when I sang those songs built on the scriptures about his faithfulness and his justice and the fact that God rules and reigns over all things. When I heard the word of God preached and I remembered his judgment on Egypt and his promises that he's made in the scriptures, it helped me to see, wait a minute, wait a minute. What I think is happening is not happening. The way that I think things are going, it's not true. He says, truly you set them in slippery places, you make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. He remembers through the history of God's people that when the wicked and the unjust seem like they're riding high, in a moment, they're swept away. Maybe he heard a sermon on the deliverance, the exodus from Egypt. Pharaoh and his empire and his power crushing the Israelites. But in one day, everything changed and Pharaoh was dead at the bottom of the Red Sea. If you continue to read the scriptures, you see again and again God delivering his people from injustice and executing his wrath and avenging their blood against the wicked. For example, Babylon, which oppressed and destroyed the southern kingdom of Judah, they themselves were destroyed in an instant, one night, when the Persians surprised attacked their capital city and wiped out the Babylonian empire. In our own times, we see this happen. Those who are deceiving and lying and manipulating us as the voting public, they're exposed by God and they never saw it coming. 
Think about Joe Biden. Whatever you think about President Biden, he has been hiding and his administration has been hiding the truth about his health and his cognitive ability. But he was losing in the polls. So he called for an early debate, earlier than any presidential debate in history. He got on the stage and everyone saw just how sick and feeble he had become. And that was the night that his political career ended. None of them saw it coming. God is a God of justice. And what the psalmist says is that when I was thinking like the world, when I was just looking at my circumstances, when I thought I had all the facts and I could judge who was good and bad and just and unjust and what God should do, I was like a beast. I was like an animal living by instinct and passion. I was getting angry and upset. I was starting to envy and I was beginning to slip into sin. We don't want to do that. We want to think about politics and justice biblically. And what you need to understand is that the Lord Jesus Christ rules and reigns. He's the king and he executes justice on this earth every day. Every day, whether you see it or not or know it or not, the Lord is executing justice. Psalm 711, God is a righteous judge, a God who expresses his wrath every day. God sees the evil in this world and he deals with it justly, 24-7, 365, every day. And there are many examples in the scriptures to be a warning to us to repent of sin in our lives, to not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, to remember that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that we do not want to come into contact with the wrath of God, that we want to confess our sins and be forgiven in Christ and walk in faith and obedience to God. But we see in the scriptures, oh no, the Lord judges every day. For example, he judges individuals. There was a man in the Old Testament named Nabal. He was a wicked man. And I'm sure his wife and those who worked for him and those around him saw his evil and asked the question, when is God going to judge this man? Well, the day came. It says in 1 Samuel, Then in the morning when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all these things, and his heart failed him, and he became like a stone. And about 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. God is the one who judges every life. He's inspecting and coming in judgment on every person. He's the one to whom every individual is accountable to. And he will make sure to do justice in his time. God also judges families. There was an evil king in the Old Testament named Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel. They killed innocent people. They stole their property. They were unjust. They killed prophets, and the time came, God decided to judge Ahab and his house, and he killed him, his wife, and his whole family, removing the house of Ahab from the earth and from history. This was just. Remember, all of his ways are justice. And so he raised up Jehu to be king and his avenger against the house of Ahab. It says in 2 Kings, so Jehu got up and went into the house. The young prophet poured the oil on his head and said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anoint you king over the Lord's people, Israel. You are to strike down the house of your master Ahab so that I may avenge the blood shed by the hand of Jezebel, his wife, the blood of my servants, the prophets, and of all the servants of the Lord. The whole house of Ahab will perish, and I will wipe out all of Ahab's males, both slave and free in Israel. God has the right to do this. God does this. He has done it in the past. He does it today. We should not doubt the justice of the Lord. He tells us that he does this in the scriptures. Whatever you think is happening, whatever you're seeing, whatever you believe is going on in American society, no matter what happens in 2024, no matter what you think happened in 2020, you and I do not have all the facts. We're not able to see what God sees. And we're not able to question God's justice because we are not a jury that's been given all the evidence. God doesn't share that with us. He rules and reigns. The Lord Jesus is the king who ex executes his justice every day. We are to believe it and to trust it and to be patient as we wait for it. He also destroys cities. We see that repeatedly throughout biblical history. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. God rained down fire from heaven and utterly destroyed those cities for their wickedness. There are many cities in this world, no doubt, that God sees. He knows their sins. He knows their crimes. He knows the injustice. He hears the cries for help, for deliverance, and in his time, he will judge. 
He will judge rightly, according to what is absolutely just, and our job is to trust his character and to be patient. He judges nations. We know that he judged Egypt and destroyed them. We know that he judged Babylon, that he judged Assyria, that even his own people, Israel, came under his judgment. In modern times, God dealt us a very powerful judgment in the Civil War for the sin of slavery. And in World War II, the Axis powers, Germany, Japan, Italy, they did wicked things, corrupt things. They unleashed all sorts of chaos on this world. And all three of those nations were destroyed and they paid the price. God is the judge of nations and cities and families and individuals. In fact, he is the judge of the whole world. At the very beginning of the story of the human race, we see that God flooded the world, killing every man, woman, and child, and every animal that walks along the ground because of the great sin that man had committed. He only spared Noah and his family. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned, king forever. No, we, no, we need to not doubt God's justice when we look at our world. We need to believe his word. And yes, there are evil people currently in powerful positions and they do seem to be gaining ground and winning and they seem to be more and more uh, effective at carrying out their schemes. The government is more and more likely to violate the Constitution and violate our rights. That's true. There is a lot of evil in the world for sure. Internationally, there's rumblings of war. But you understand that God also reveals to us in the Bible how to think about those things. God knows how to use evil for good. God is able to use evil, touch evil, control evil, deploy evil for his purposes, and it never violates his holiness. He is not like us. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. God is not one of us that we should judge him. He is capable of directing the flow of history and even using evil for good. So when you see a wicked nation or a wicked ruler or a wicked whatever, and they seem to be riding high and mighty, remember, God uses the wicked for good. He punishes wicked nations with other wicked nations. In Isaiah chapter 10, it says, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger. Woe means judgment is coming to you. I'm coming for you. I'm going to judge you now. But then he says, woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger. The staff in their hands is my wrath. Assyria was a wicked nation and they were, they were brutal. I mean, just talk about human rights violations. The Assyrians were some bad dudes. And when they came and destroyed nations, God is saying that they are the instrument of his wrath. He is avenging the sin committed by those nations, and he's using Assyria to do it. I will send him, Assyria, against a godless nation. I will command him to go against a people destined for my rage. God has judged these nations. They're guilty in his eyes, and now is the day of judgment. And what instrument does he use? Assyria. But Assyria is so wicked. Yes, they are also in line for judgment, but in God's time. He can use evil for good. He also uses it to purify the church. Now, I told you that in 2020, I was feeling really angry at the injustice that I was seeing. And I was reading through 1 Peter, and God really helped me see things the way they are, and to be patient, and to trust him, and understand why we were going through some of these things. And oftentimes, what God will do is he will use hard times produced by injustice as a way of heating up our lives so that our faith is purified, so that we grow in maturity, so that his church is blessed for a future season of blessing. And so he says, in this you rejoice, your trials, your troubles, the injustices that you're facing, though for now, a little while, it is necessary for you to be grieved by various trials. God is using these trials, using these troubles for good. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, your faith is precious to God. This is what God is doing in your life. He is purifying and growing your faith. He's transforming you into the image of his son. And he uses hard things to do this work. He says, so that that faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As we grow 
in our faith and our love and our maturity as Christians through the hard things that we face, this brings more praise, more glory, and more honor to Christ, and more praise and more glory and more honor to you on the last day when all the footage is revealed, when the whole story is completed, when we look back and see at what has happened and we thought that was the worst ever and it was so unjust and then God shows us what he was doing, it will result in praise and glory and honor for God and his people. And this is what he wants to do through the hard things. So yeah, God, let's, let's injustice go for a while. He lets injustice go and we have to go through it and it's a fire and it's hard, but God is using it to purify us as Christians. And the final thing that God has often done in history, and this is very comforting to me, is that God uses the wicked for a future period of prosperity for his people. Oftentimes the troubles we're facing in case of America is that we've elected people who are not good at their jobs, whether they're incompetent like Trump says, or they're corrupt and wicked and evil like others say, there is a lot of injustice that's happening in California especially, and it's because we elected these people, they did these things, and then we reelected them. Now what God will often do is he'll allow his enemies and those who are in open rebellion against him to rise and gain more and more power. They get cocky, they stick their chests out, they do these things in broad daylight. They join each other. They form alliances. They form gangs. They form organizations. And they feel like they rule this world. And what God is doing is he's allowing them to concentrate themselves into one place, to reveal themselves, to hang themselves, so to speak. And then in a moment, they're washed away. This is a great picture. Uh, you see this, this, this dynamic in this great story of Daniel. Daniel was the governor of the capital of Persia. He was the most powerful person under the king. But there were satraps and governors of the other parts of the empire, and they hated Daniel. They worshipped idols, they were wicked men, and they wanted to kill Daniel. So they got a law passed that said you couldn't pray to the one true God. And of course, Daniel continued to do that. And then they had him arrested and brought before the king, and because he had broken the law, he was thrown into the lion's den. Now God spared his life. And the next morning when the king came and found Daniel alive, he was so mad at these wicked people who had tricked him that he threw them all in the lion's den cleaning house for the Persian Empire in one moment. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. Now think about that. You had bad people, corrupt people, who were ruling over parts of the Persian Empire. You think they were delivering justice to the citizens of Persia? You think that they were men of integrity? Or do you think they were men who took bribes? Men who persecuted and oppressed the people for their own self-interest. Nobody benefited from their rule. But how would God remove all of them so that they could be replaced with men of integrity? Well, he did it through this story with Daniel. He allowed them to rise, allowed them to pass the law. Daniel had to go through the suffering. He had to constantly pray and seek God and trust God. His faith was purified, the, the faith of the people of God that were spread out all throughout the Persian Empire. Hearing this story about Daniel, their faith was being purified. And then in one moment, all these people were wiped out. And I'm sure they were replaced with men of integrity so that the Persian people could have a future of peace and justice. God cleans house like this in history. And in the periods before the house cleaning, it just feels bad. It feels unjust. It doesn't seem right. God, why are you delaying your justice? Why are you denying us justice? He's not denying us justice. He's intending to prosper his people in the future. No, God is not asleep, he's not slow, he's not dumb, he doesn't weaken and wink at injustice, he judges it. But he has his own timetable, and that is not for us to question. God is merciful and patient. For example, God told his servant Abraham that he would have a son and that he would have a son that would become a great nation and that that nation would actually be sent down to Egypt for 400 years. And then after that 400 years, God would bring them out of Egypt in a miraculous way and back to this land where they would be used as God's instrument to judge the Amorites. Wow, that's a complicated plan. God has a plan to judge the Amorites 500 years in the future and he's telling Abraham, wow, that's too big for me. That's, 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 that's too cosmic. I mean, I, I don't know that I can understand God's plans, but he tells Abraham this. He says, and four generations, your gener and, and four generations your de after four generations, your descendants will return here to this land for the sins of the Amorites do not yet warrant their destruction. So God is telling him, I'm watching the Amorites and they are sinning against me and they're committing wickedness and abominations and they're committing injustices. And I am the God who rules over heaven and earth and I will judge. There is a day coming of judgment, but not yet. 
their sins have not yet warranted their destruction, but they will. And if you read forward in the new, in, if you read forward in the Bible, in the book of Numbers, you see that the Amorites are destroyed by the Israelites because the Amorites attack the Israelites and God gives the Israelites victory and they utterly destroy the Amorites. But God had decided this 400 years before. Wow. God has a timetable. We don't know what it is. And it's not for us to presume on God or to judge God or to question his integrity. He's good. He's a just judge who judges every day because he's the king. But the Lord Jesus is not just the king who executes justice every day. He's also the great high priest who offers forgiveness and mercy every day. And we thank God for it. The Lord is merciful. He's patient every day. And this explains why he doesn't squash us the moment we sin. I mean, if God judged us justly and strictly, who could stand? We want the Lord to be fast, to judge others when they do us wrong. But we want him to be slow and patient with us when we do wrong, right? This is not justice. No, God is merciful, he is patient, and he is waiting and giving space for people to turn from their sins, to repent, and to be washed clean of their sins by following his son Jesus. God is a merciful God, a patient God, and we must be merciful and patient too as his people. Remember Nineveh, that great wicked city, the capital of Assyria. God sent Jonah to them and said, tell them in 40 days I'm coming and I'm going to judge their city. Jonah didn't want to do that because he knew God was merciful and he knew that if they repented, God would not destroy them and God want, or Jonah wanted God to destroy Nineveh. And so he rebelled and he ran away and he ended up back in the city where God wanted him and he, he preached and he told them that God was coming to destroy the city in 40 days. And guess what? They repented. And afterwards, Jonah was very mad. And God said to him, Jonah, there's over 100,000 children here who don't know their left from their right and you would have me destroy their lives? No, God is far more merciful than we are, far more patient than we are, and far more just than we are. He is not like us. He's a merciful God. And so God doesn't want us as his children to despise his mercy and despise his patience because it's his mercy and patience that explains why we are Christians. I mean, if God dealt with us strictly according to justice, we would all be in hell because that's what we deserve. We've all sinned against God. We've all rebelled against him. And the just penalty for that is death and eternal separation from him in hell. But he doesn't send us there. He doesn't kill us instantly. He gives us life and he's patient with us. And God says, or do you despise the riches of his kindness? Do you despise the riches of his restraint? Do you despise the riches of his patience? Not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. Why is God being patient with those who are doing wrong today? Because he wants to lead them to repentance. God is giving them space to turn from their sins, just like he did for you and me. This explains why injustice goes on. These are good reasons to understand why injustice exists in our world. I mean, the most obvious reason why injustice exists in this world is because you and I are in this world. We're not righteous. We're not good. There's no one righteous. No, not one. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us practice sin and injustice all of our days. And yet God is patient and God has saved us in Christ. And this is how we want to think about injustice. As we look forward to the election and afterwards, if things get worse, which they seem like they will, never doubt God's justice and always remember God's mercy. Now, what do we do if we are under attack? What do we do if it gets to the situation where our own government begins to persecute us as the church? The state begins to persecute the church. They begin to violate our rights, taking away our life, liberty, and property. What do we do when we are facing persecution and injustice? How do Christians resist it in faith? Well, there are three responses that God gives us that are lawful, that Christians have been practicing in faith for thousands of years. They are fulminate, flee, and only then fight. Fulminate, flee, and lastly, fight. Fulminate means to speak out. It means to protest. It means to make noise. It means to, to push back lawfully. And in America, if we're facing persecution, if our rights are being violated by the state, then we are lawfully permitted by God to fulminate, to speak out, right? We should, we should speak and talk about what is true and right and good. If someone's lying, we should call it out. 
If someone's trying to manipulate us, we should call it out. If something is wrong, we should call it wrong. And if something is right, we should call it right. We should be salt and light in our political world. The conscience of the nation, that's what the church should be. God says to us, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. God doesn't want us to sit there silently when wickedness is going on, when people are trying to lie and twist the truth in our society and, and confuse and deceive our fellow citizens. No, we are the people of the book. We have the word of truth. And when we know what is right and what is wrong and what is good and what is evil and what is just and unjust, we should speak it and say so. And we have the right to politically protest like this in our country. We have lots of ways of doing it. Whether it's laughing at something that's just patently false or directly opposing it, or having a conversation with a coworker to tell them what you believe is true. This is a way that we are able to speak out against injustice directed at us. We also boycott. We have the freedom to choose what we're going to buy. And this is what people did with Bud Light and Target when they draped themselves in the trans flags. They lost billions of dollars in business. And the next year, Target backed off. Why? Because they care more about the color green than they do about the rainbow. And that was a lot of people, a lot of Christians, and a lot of normal traditional people who used their vote to fulminate. They didn't go to arms. They didn't pick up guns. They used the money that they had and the purchasing power that they had to push back against injustice. And you also have the right to take people to court. Christians should absolutely use their law, legal rights in court to protect themselves. This is something that you saw Grace Community Church do during 2020. John MacArthur's church was told by Gavin Newsom in the state of California, like all the other churches, that they had to shut down, that they were non-essential, while pot shops and liquor stores and big box stores like Walmart and Target were open for business. And after a couple weeks, they realized something's wrong. And so they began to, to worship, to meet on the Lord's Day every Sunday, just like the Lord Jesus commands us to do. And the state told them they had to stop, and the state came after them. Well, they took the state to court, and they won. They won an $800,000 settlement, and the state of California admitted that it was wrong and it violated the First Amendment rights of Grace Community Church. Now, while this was going on, there were a lot of Christian pastors around the country, big megachurch pastors that were hissing and tiss tissing against Grace Community Church, saying they were somehow not loving their neighbors to be open. But actually, what they were doing was they were using their right to go to law to protect their rights as citizens. This is warranted. This is lawful. This is what we do as Christians. We fulminate in this way. Paul did it. He was constantly being chased around the Mediterranean and the Roman Empire, and he often used his citizenship as a way of defending his rights against oppression. For example, in Acts 22, 29, they were about to beat Paul, and he told him, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. If you beat me, you're going to be dead, because if you, if you violate the rights of a Roman citizen, if you were to whip or to beat or to physically harm a Roman citizen before there was a trial, the penalty was death. And so it says the soldiers who were about to interrogate Paul quickly withdrew when they heard that he was a Roman citizen. And the commander was frightened because he had ordered him to be bound and whipped. Why were they afraid? Because they violated Paul's rights. And he, they knew that he would appeal. He would take them to court and they would pay the price. So we absolutely want to use the law to protect our rights. This is a way that we lawfully resist injustice. One of our members at our church lost his job during COVID for his faith. And he is suing the company that took his rights away. And we hope that he wins. And we hope they pay a price so that they stop violating the rights of Christians like you and me. Now, this doesn't work. And there are Christians in some places where they can't go to law or they don't have the freedom of speech or the injustice is so powerful that they're actually coming after you, your family, your livelihood. It is lawful for you to flee. You don't have to stay, but you can go. Jesus says, when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. It's lawful to flee. If you've exercised all of your rights in fulmination, if you protested, if you've spoken out, if you've boycotted, if you've refused to participate, and if you've stepped away and you've gone to law and all of those remedies don't work, you can flee. And if none of those work, if you can't you know, use the law and fulminate, and if you can't flee anywhere because there's nowhere to flee, then as a last resort, you may fight to defend your life and your liberty and your family. This is what happened in the American Revolution. We wrote letters to the King of England, fulminating, pointing out that we had the right to govern ourselves. We had constitutions and contracts between us and the King of England that Parliament was in violation of, and we were only asking that our rights were respected. And we did this over and over. We boycotted their goods, we politically protested, we took them to court, but no matter what we did, the British government refused to give us back our liberty. 
And so we declared independence. We left, we fled, so to speak, but the British wouldn't have it. And so they sent their armies to kill our citizens. And we fought a war defensively and we won. This is the Christian way of resisting injustice. This is how Christians have resisted injustice for thousands of years. But in order to do this, in order to know whether you should fulminate or flee or fight, that takes a lot of wisdom. So Francis Schaeffer said something very helpful. He said, one should not employ force if he may save himself by flight, nor should one employ flight if he can save himself and defend himself by protest and the employment of constitutional means of redress. If you can use the law, use the law. If you, if you can use the law, you don't need to flee. And if you can flee without fighting, you should flee. In short, there is a proper time and procedure for everything under the sun. And wise Christians like men of Issachar must have an understanding of the times. That's why we're talking about this today. Because the days may be coming when the government is actually very unjust. And they're actually trying to persecute us and take our lives, liberties, and properties in a, in a major way. And we want to be wise and we want to be thinking ahead. So this takes wisdom. How do I know what to do? Do I stay in my job when they do these things and they're starting to persecute me and demand I say things and write things and, and do things that I don't think are right? They violate my conscience, they violate my faith. Or do I quit? Do I stand up and speak up or do I let this one go? Should I take them to court? Should I move out of California? Is now the time to fight back? These are big questions and it requires great wisdom. Where are you gonna get that from? That brings us to our fourth F. How do Christians resist injustice? They fulminate, they flee, they fight, and they know which one to do because they follow Christ. They follow Christ. There are many decisions that we have to make and Christ will guide us. If any man lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. That's what the scripture says. But if you're not a follower of Christ, there is no wisdom for you from God. If you want to call out to God and ask for wisdom and his direction on which way to go, then you have to become one of his children. You have to be washed of your sins and forgiven. You have to be made right with God. And that happens when you put your life and faith in Jesus Christ's hands. When you confess your sins to God, when you receive Christ's death and burial and resurrection in your place, when you make Jesus your Lord, then you're born again. Then you're brought into the family of God. Then you can call out to your Father and he will guide your steps. He's been doing this for thousands and thousands of years. For example, that wicked King Ahab that I told you about earlier, he had a guy who worked for him named Obadiah. Obadiah was an insider. He worked inside of this wicked administration. He was in charge of the palace. He ran the palace of Ahab, the king. He feared God. Should he quit? Should he get, give up his job because the, his boss is so wicked and he's engaged in so much wicked things? Should he stay? I mean, what, what should he do? Well, he stayed. He kept his faith hidden and he saved a hundred prophets because Jezebel was murdering all the prophets of God. And this man, Obadiah, who worked inside the palace, he put 50 prophets in one cave and 50 prophets in another and he saved their lives. Now, if he would have quit his job and left in protest, he wouldn't have been able to save those prophets. Sometimes you stay. You may work for a wicked organization or an organization that's going wobbly or starting to move into a direction that's not good and it's not time to leave. There's still good you can do. You stay and you work for good. You work for justice. You do what's right before God. God sprinkles his people like salt and light everywhere to hold back the wickedness, to hold back the injustice like Obadiah. But on the outside, you had Elijah. He was an outsider. He was blowing the whistle against the wickedness of Ahab's government. He was calling them out, calling out their injustice. He was warning them. So you could see Obadiah thinking, well, maybe I should quit my job and go be with, uh, with Elijah. But Elijah never told Obadiah, you need to quit that job. You need to leave. That's a wicked organization. You need to leave. No, no. It's a matter of prudence and wisdom. How do you know whether you should fulminate or flee or fight? Well, you have to follow Christ. He'll teach you. This is one example where this kind of decision is hard to make, but Christ will teach us. Remember, all the scriptures are there to equip us for every good work. Christians have faced tyranny and tyrannical governments before. They've overcome them lawfully, justly, and in faith. This isn't the church's first rodeo. And one of the things that's happening right now in the West, in the churches in the West, is we're beginning to recover resources that we once widely read and knew. Resources that teach us as Christians how to resist injustice lawfully and in faith. Some of these books, which are now being reprinted, are books like Lex Rex, 
written by uh, Samuel Rutherford, The Law is King, or Vindicii Contra Tyrannus. That was a book written by Christians in France who were being persecuted by a tyrannical king. And they go through case study by case study in scripture, showing us how we are to resist injustice in a lawful and faithful way so that we don't become revolutionaries, avengers of our own blood, taking vengeance into our own hands, fighting lawlessly against the state. No, when that happens, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. The Lord says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. So the question is, as Christians, how do I think about injustice and how do we respond as a church well? Well, these books were written to help Christians do just that. The most recent one is called Slaying Leviathan, written by Glenn Sunshine, and he traces the history of Christian resistance theory, when it's right, when it's wrong, and how Christians should resist tyranny lawfully and in faith. But what we should never do is react in fear. What we should never do is question God's justice. What we should do is think like Christians and understand that God is a righteous judge and he pours out his wrath every day. But he's also a merciful high priest and he extends his mercy every day. And so we as his people need to be patient. He uses evil for good and he can do good for us even in the midst of evil. And yes, if we start facing heavy handed injustice, then we will resist. We will resist lawfully and we will resist in faith, as Christians have done for centuries, and God will help us. He will guide us because we follow Christ. This is a biblical understanding of injustice today. Whatever happens in November, whatever outcome occurs, whether it continues to be winter in America or if it breaks free into a new spring, we want to think ahead as Christians so that we're prepared to respond whatever happens. And I think it's important for us to be thinking through these issues before the election occurs so that we don't get played, so that we don't react, so that we don't doubt God or begin to compromise with evil or begin to take vengeance into our own hands. We've already seen that play out in 2020. We don't want that to play out again in 2024. So what are some next steps you can take to respond to this message in faith? Number one, I want to encourage you to follow Christ. If you don't follow Christ, who will guide you? Who will protect you? Who will direct you? Who are you going to trust as the world becomes darker and darker? Maybe just for a season? Jesus Christ loves you. He gave his life for you. Rather than you receiving the just penalty for your sin, rather than God bringing down his wrath on you in justice, instead he poured his wrath out on his son. And instead of giving his son the blessings and rewards of his obedience, he is offering those blessings to you. It's a great exchange. But to receive this salvation and to receive a relationship with your Father in heaven, you must bend the knee to Christ and make him your Lord and Savior. And I want to encourage you to do that. And the symbol that you've done that is your baptism. And so if you've committed your life to Christ but you have not yet been baptized, I want to encourage you to sign up for baptism at Church in the Valley. Number two, I told you that Psalm 73 was a big help to me. And I want to encourage you to read that. But one of the things that guy does is he cries out for justice. And God wants you to cry out for justice. So set an alarm at 7.30, either in the morning or at night, whichever you prefer. Set it for an alarm every day. And every day spend one minute praying for justice. Whatever's on your mind, whatever's on your heart, whatever you think is right, just cry out to God like the psalmist did. It will help relieve the pressure and the sense of anxiety that you feel. It'll help you be patient and remind you that our God reigns and yes, he is a God of justice. And then finally, it was very helpful to me to read 1 Peter. So maybe you don't have a habit of reading the Bible daily, but I want to encourage you, if you don't do that, to start that. You can read three verses a day, just three verses, and think about what they say. If you read three verses from 1 Peter between now and November 5th, you'll read that book two and a half times. It will encourage you, it will strengthen you, it will teach you how to think about these things, it will help you respond in faith, whatever happens. And I think that would be a wonderful use of your time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your justice. <clears throat> and we thank you for your mercy. We don't doubt it, we believe it. And we pray that you give us patience. Lord, we ask that you would give us rulers and uh, leaders who are just and wise and men and women of integrity. And God, we pray that you would protect us from injustice. But if it comes, help us to discern how we should respond and how we should resist lawfully in faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.